Welcome to the Dated and AI talk for this month. We're really happy to have Matei go ahead and joining us. He is an assistant professor at Stanford, uh, working on computer systems and machine learning as part of Stanford Dawn. So if you have questions about Stanford Dawn, or Apache Spark, by all means, go ahead and prop them into the Q&A channel. Uh, he's also co-founder and chief technology officer uh, uh, of Databricks, uh, the data and AI platform startup. During his PhD, Matei started the Apache Spark project, which is now one of the most widely used frameworks for distributed data processing. Um, he also started uh, other widely used data and AI software, uh, such as MLflow, Apache Mesos, and Spark Streaming. And for that matter, if there's a call out, yes, I am sitting in a space station. This is currently uh, a picture of the cupola of the ISS. I figured this was a very nice place to stay. So, hey, Matei, welcome aboard. Why don't you start off and give us a little introduction for yourself by let's jump backwards to your time at Waterloo. If we can start with that, please. Yeah, thanks, Denny. I'm glad you're staying safe over there um, in the space station. Um, so uh, yeah, so uh, I guess the question is sort of how did I get into computer science and end up ultimately working on data centers and Apache Spark? And it, it was kind of, um, you know, it wasn't the most direct road, I guess, uh, but um, basically in, uh, you know, when I was kind of in like uh, in middle school and later in high school and so on, we, I got a computer at home and I was, I became interested in programming because I wanted to like make video games. So I spent a lot of time kind of learning that on my own. Um, and then when I went to college, I wasn't really sure what to do necessarily, but I went for uh, computer science because I felt that's where I already know how to do some stuff. And it's also very quick to try out new things and so on. So I figured I'd start in that. Um, but at that point, you know, I was just interested in uh, kind of building things and like maybe graphics, if you ask me what I wanted to work on, I thought that was the most interesting, coolest looking thing. Um, also very hard to do in terms of performance and so on. So it, it seemed pretty neat. Um, but um, when I was there, I, I did this. Uh, so I went to school at Waterloo in Canada and then I learned um, I, I learned that they had this undergraduate research uh, program, um, and I signed up for that, and I got matched with this professor who was doing networking, especially peer-to-peer -peer networking at the time, and he was, you know, a researcher who was focused on, like, coming up with new algorithms and new system design. His name is Cushions. Um, he actually uh, now moved to the UK, but he's been at Waterloo uh, and previously at Cornell University as a professor. And, uh, yeah, and... Um, I thought it was very interesting to work on these peer-to-peer -peer systems. There were questions there like, how do you do approximate search in a peer-to-peer -peer system? Actually, the first research paper I worked on is a short paper. It's called like, how, how can you find files online when you can't even spell? So it was kind of a fun thing. Um, and, uh, you know, there was just like interesting to think about like how all these like different machines working together could uh, could compute something and could make it happen. So I worked on that as an undergrad on a few projects there. Um, and then in grad school, uh, when I went, when I was applying for grad schools, you know, everyone was kind of interviewing me for uh, computer networking, but I wasn't necessarily set on doing networking. I was actually more excited about these systems, these distributed systems, and I wanted to maybe try something else. So when I started at Berkeley, I, I took these, uh, these seminar courses they had on data centers where they were doing research on them. And I started doing research in that area. And uh, in the first project, we tried to add some tracing to Hadoop, which was very early on, but it was open source. It was like the closest open source thing there was to a you know commercial type system there because all this stuff in, in Google and Microsoft and so on was closed source at the time. Um, uh, this was around 2007, basically. Um, and so we added this tracing stuff and we found a lot of like performance issues in Hadoop. And then we started working on just improving it. And in doing that, I also talked to a lot of users and started to learn about what other programming models and other applications they might need. Uh, but yeah, it definitely wasn't like the, the first thing I, I thought to do, but it, it, it fit in with the kind of stuff I liked. And um, I saw there is a lot to do and there's a, a great community around this open source thing where you can actually talk to the users. And even as a researcher, you can write some code and have these like people try it out in these very large environments. Gotcha. Well, I mean, 
So that actually almost wanted me to ask the question, what games were you into? <laughs> Just as a starting point. But actually, yeah. let's, yeah, let's start with that before we skip right back to the how we actually got into Hadoop, for that matter. <laughs> yeah, I, my favorite ones were actually like the, the real-time strategy games, like okay. uh, Age of Empires and StarCraft, which again, I guess, are like lots of like little and kind of stupid you know, units that you're trying to work together. And I think even before I was really programming, I was making some maps in those that um, you could share maps online for other people to use and stuff. So um, so that was sort of like open source in some way. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Well, no, you, you've got to start somewhere. And actually the gaming yeah. community in the past was definitely one of those ways that basically that's how we communicate and shared a lot of that, uh, the geek stuff, right? So yeah, and more, there's, there's yeah. also an open source strategy game I worked on as uh, in college, which is called Zero AD. It's still around. It's uh, And it's it's actually really cool. Like it's got a very good artist who made a lot of like really good looking uh, kind of content for it. So yeah, it was a fun community. Yeah. <laughs> so okay, but I'm pretty sure we're not here. That people aren't here to listen to about uh, gaming at this case. Yep. But let's switch gears a bit, a little bit about the Hadoop stuff. So, so what spotted you to basically go to look at Hadoop in the first place? I mean, I get the context that you were interested in distributed systems when you went to Berkeley, but why start with Hadoop? I, I'm curious. Yeah, I was, I, I, you mentioned the closed system, so I, I'm not trying to skip that part. I'm just calling out the like there were other systems that you could possibly have looked at, or maybe, uh, in fact, maybe you wanted to look at a closed system. So that's mm -hmm. why I was just curious. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, so I think so. When I started, you know, there was just this like basically the way the courses are organized there is uh, you have these kind of seminar courses where you read some research papers, and you're also su supposed to do a project for a semester. So I thought, what can I do in like five months that um, you know, I, I can actually do an interesting project. And I was working with Andy Konwinski, another Databricks co-founder, and we looked at among the open source ones, there was this Hadoop, which, which was like MapAgers that we had read about. And um, we, we thought, okay, we'll try using that. Oh, and it, and there was also this stuff already built up at Berkeley called Xtrace, that was a Java tracing framework, kind of similar to things like Dapper uh, today, um, uh, basically. So. Um, so, 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 so we said, okay, that's based in Java. Hadoop is based in Java, so we can just add Xtrace to Hadoop and then see what it does. Um, and then after that, um, like for for my, I wanted, to, you know, most people did an internship in their first summer, um, and my advisor Jan said, you know, this open source Hadoop thing seems to be gaining quite a bit of traction. Why don't you go? And work at one of the users of this instead of working at like you know Google or Microsoft on their closed stuff uh, because maybe you know there'll be more interesting things with these open source users. So so I did that. I did this internship at Facebook early on, and I got to meet a lot of the Hadoop committers and stuff through that. Got it. Got it. So as you progressed, what was it that well about Hadoop that was sort of that spawned you to basically ultimately create Spark. Like you, you obviously were hitting various different walls. I mean, again, you put the tracer, you, you were able to monitor it. So what, what by working within the folks at Facebook, by going ahead and working with Hadoop, what like use cases or scenarios that ultimately led you to realize, eh, maybe Hadoop's not the thing that I want to be working on per se. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, there were a few things and, you know, don't get me wrong, at, at the time, we also thought like starting any kind of new engine would be would be quite hard because it needed to reach uh, kind of the, the maturity of this production system and you needed to convince people uh, to use it. So so we, we did want to do as much stuff as possible inside Hadoop if we can, but, but there were a few things. I, I saw that, first of all, in these companies like Facebook, as soon as there was a large scale like data storage um, and processing infrastructure in place, a lot more people wanted access to it. And those were not Java programmers. They were the data scientists and SQL users and like all kinds of, you know, just people who wanted with less effort to be able to query that data. So even in Facebook, they were building Hive as a SQL language language on top of Hadoop and um, you know th there was this need to make it easier to use and even for the MapReduce developers they were spending a lot of time on boilerplate so I thought okay the, the ease of programming is important and the other thing was in terms of performance it was very clear that people wanted to do interactive 
queries, not just batch jobs, uh, whereas MapReduce and Hadoop were initially designed for web indexing, which is a batch job. Um, and it was um, also uh, interesting that they wanted to do machine learning and it wasn't very efficient for these iterative machine learning algorithms. So, so these are, so we kind of asked like, how can we make a system that's sort of as scalable as MapReduce, but supports interactive queries and uh, iterative machine learning most easily. And at that point we said, okay, we'll just try building one from scratch and, um, and see what happens. So, yeah. Got it, got it. So that, so that spotted as part of the AMP lab projects, right? Where you basically were realizing the some of the deficiencies or the weaknesses of Hadoop and realizing that you wanted to address things of like interactive queries and machine learning, which is great. But then I guess what what spotted that to into the growth of the community that you end up having? Because I still remember when I was first working on Hadoop and then I saw this like little burgeoning project out of Berkeley, right? It's like, hey, that's really cool. I remember mainly because I was sort of suffering from the same thing as you were, or trying to run Hadoop and I'm going, great, I'm trying to do just some, a simple query and it would take, you know, a few minutes just to solve something that would normally take seconds, right? So, so what spawned that into like, in essence, the group of people that you end up working with over at the AMP lab to what ultimately became the Apache Spark project? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, I think turning it from a research project into an open source project, it happened sort of gradually and based on feedback as we saw people using it to do interesting things. So initially we put something out there and we said, yeah, you know, try it out. It's, uh, we tried to make it very easy to install alongside Hadoop and so on. Um, and, but, um, but then I, over time as people actually tried it and, you know, for the first few people, I just worked with them like directly uh, because it was still very hard to, to use. So I, I just went, you know, and helped them out with it. Uh, we saw that we were learning a lot from how they're using it. So for example, one of the very first like users uh, was doing essentially streaming, which we hadn't thought about. They were saying like, I'm going to keep some, some stuff in memory in these RDDs and then I'm going to like load new stuff and join it against it and update something and then um, that's the application. So um, so we thought, okay, we're, we can actually learn a lot from building this out and, and working with these users and um, it, you know, th th that's why we spend more time on that. And of course, over time, the community grew. So it's, it's not just us at Berkeley, but other companies uh, were also putting in a significant amount of investment. But definitely the first, like, I'd say at least four years was, uh, you know, we had to do uh, that stuff mostly ourselves and uh, to, to, to get it to the point where other people would, would want to uh, contribute to it. Got it. Got it. Well, actually, the, this is I'm, I'm asking part of a question that just came on the Q&A panel, but not exactly this one, because I figured we're going to ask that other question a little bit later. But, you know, since you started off with, you know, Java, with the monitoring, with Hadoop, and then so what, why Scala for starters? Like, you know, why switch it? You know, why, why did you decide that Scala made more sense? You, you've got lots of papers and presentations mm -hmm. I recall in the past that actually described it. But I figure for a lot of people who might be relatively new to Apache Spark, they, I, I think giving them that context or that history would be super helpful. Yeah, I think for the user facing API, because we saw that people really wanted to query stuff interactively and quickly, um, we thought Scala was really good for that. The, the functional programming and the much more concise syntax and the ability to build uh, basically like uh, DSLs in it, domain specific languages. And at the time, if you remember like Java didn't have Lambda expressions and it didn't have an interactive shell, whereas Scala had all of these. Um, so, uh, so actually, even even before it was, it supported anything interactive in Spark. We we chose Scala to make it easy to write these jobs, so you don't have to have like a dozen map and reduce classes. And then later, I had this idea to kind of hack the Scala interpreter and see if I can connect it to a cluster and get all the classes that you generate when you type codes to be shipped to the worker nodes. Um, and it turned out you could actually do that, which you know took a little bit of work. But, uh, but then that made for really cool demos where it's interactive. And that would only have made sense in Scala. Uh, now, yeah, today, you know, would you start with Scala? Uh, it kind of depends. I think so. One of the questions 
uh, at Mason asked like, would you start with something like Rust, which is a native language, but it has the memory safety. Um, that might be a good idea, actually, if you were really focused on bare metal performance. Um, I think Scala is still great to work with. You know, it's if, if you have a team that knows how to work with it, it's very productive. Um, another option to, to work on it, because it's still a, a much better known language. Um, I think the JVM was also nice in terms of all the, the monitoring tools that exist so, and debugging tools. And I think those are still not quite as mature for um, something like, like Rust. But on the other hand, maybe the integration with Python and so on is better with native languages. Yeah. No, it makes sense, makes sense. Uh, actually, by the way, there's a, there are actually some open source side projects that are starting to have Rust actually work with Spark for precisely that reason. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah that's yeah. cool, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so saying that, I, I did want to shift gears a little bit before we back to go back to the, Q, the current set of Q&A just because I wanted to follow a little bit of a flow, which is, okay, so you created the Apache Spark project. It turns out to be a wild success. There's a lots of, there's a very large community of users and companies that are just now taking the uh, taking a huge bet on Spark. I guess the first question that I would like to ask based on this is that, did you foresee even that? Like, did you foresee the popularity? Before we even talk about Databricks, did you even foresee the popularity no, I, that Spark had? Yeah. I don't think that, I don't think we were expecting that at first. And uh, so, as I said, it took a while. It was kind of a feedback loop where we saw people are using it, and let's let's make it better for these things. And um, and uh, eventually, it it also got solid enough that most many more people could use it. Uh, it wasn't really our goal, but it was nice. And in hindsight, you know, if we were like a company or something back then, I, I could see like a, a, an organization that's mainly about building new products could say like let's try to build a better product. But we were a research lab. So we were also, you know, we, we wanted to just make sure we're doing interesting things that somehow have impact on practice, whether it's through our stuff or through influencing uh, the other things that people are already building. Gotcha. So then, then you've got this wild project, uh, amazingly popular. I'm curious then how, like, what was the history in terms of the getting what's now the founders of Databricks together to create what is now in fact Databricks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think it, it was kind of a natural point in time to think about um, a company because a bunch of us were finishing our PhDs and there were also some people on the team who had already been interested even before starting grad school and starting a company like, like uh, for example, Patrick Wendell, one of the, the co-founders, that was one of his main kind of goals with with grad school was uh uh you know to look into like learning enough technology and building something and starting his own company so uh so it we we all just kind of talked about it i think the the more the more interesting thing was also that we decided to go kind of cloud only at the beginning that was the more controversial thing but um we had been using the cloud as a research group a lot, and we also thought it will be faster to iterate and to develop a good product that way. Um, and so that's the that's like one bet we made where we explicitly said we're not going to do, you know, on premise whatever all these things. We'll try to be really great in the cloud and just try to build a platform that requires less kind of setup and management overall that way. Um, so yeah, yeah. So I'm curious. I still remember the time where. Like how painful or how hard was that decision to basically at the time when Databricks was being created that, you know, there was plenty of plenty of people that were all going, hey, you know, you really need to go on prem. Like I still remember those. Like, <laughs> and mm -hmm. you got far worse than I did. So there, you need to go on prem. So how hard was it to make that decision so early on? Because you were making a huge bet to go in the cloud early on, and at the time that you were doing it, it was definitely considered a little bit more on the like, what are you thinking side of things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was definitely tricky, but there were also, you know, it kind of depends how you look at things. So for example, when we uh, first visited Andreessen Horowitz and kind of like pitched the, the company to Ben Horowitz, some of his uh, partners in the room also asked like, wait, what is the on-premise plan? Is, is this cloud only? And then Ben said, well, if you're, you're starting a, an enterprise company in 2014 and it's not in the cloud, like what are you thinking? Because from his perspective, it takes a few years to even like build the product and get it ready and like actually begin selling it. So, um, so he wanted to make sure it can support the cloud. Um, I think from our perspective, we were getting enough like 
early interest to validate the platform. And there was always the fallback of, okay, we, we can try to package it and um, offer the thing on-prem, but it was definitely tempting. And a lot of the people you hired, like, you know, when you interview anyone for like head of sales <laughs> or whatever, they'd immediately tell you like, oh, it's super easy. I'll get you like a, you know, $10 million deal, like, you know, in a, in a month, you, you just let me sell it on-prem and that's it. Like, <laughs> um, and we had to say, no, you know, we, we need, we need some, a smarter strategy where like, actually, you know, we're, we're not spending all our time with like many bespoke configurations. And we actually have a great product that people will keep wanting uh, rather than the thing that they'll migrate away from when they migrate to cloud. So, um, so definitely lots of conversations. Eventually it became obvious even to, you know, sort of the salespeople that uh, uh, that this was a better way to go. So, yeah. Yeah, no, which is, which is pretty cool because I think that's still one of the telltale signs about the about some of the decisions you and the, the founders had made early on about like about that shift or the transition for the future. And yeah. which but actually, we, we made a lot of wrong yeah. decisions. Oh, too. sure, don't, sure, don't sure. But, <laughs> but th there were some, you know, there were things that you can fix later, but this one turned out to be a, a good one from the beginning. <laughs> so. No, no, no problem. No, the, the only reason I was bringing that because it actually does a great segue to Alexei's question about vision uh -huh. for the future, right? So so you, you had a cool vision and just like you said, this decision happened to be spot on. Awesome. So what's your vision for uh, that you feel that the you and the Spark community itself are for the future? Like what, mm -hmm. what do you see the vision for Spark for the next few years? Yeah, I think in general, I think it, it, there's still the same kind of high level goal of making large scale data processing easier for more uh, users. And um, there's a few aspects to that. So first of all, even for the current users of Spark, I think configuring and tuning and debugging and so on are hard. So that's like one of the top things that I think we can improve there. Um, and, uh, you know, always looking for like new ways to do that. Uh, but then there's also uh, kind of expanding the set of users. So for example, a huge change that happened around like I would say 2014, very soon after we started Databricks, maybe some of it was happening before too, is the change to data frames as the most uh, widely used API and Spark SQL underneath. And that opened up Spark to uh, data scientists that otherwise would have had to learn like a very different programming model. So it actually increased the number of users a lot, uh, but it also made a lot of things better for the engineers who had been writing the Scala and RDD stuff before, because it just turns out for a lot of the use cases that they do, um, you know, it's it's easier to express and it's more robust and so on uh, if you express it in data frames. And it eliminated like a whole class of issues, you know, like many kind of like out of memory issues and serialization and whatever, all these problems that were happening when, um, you know, or like performance issues that were happening when, when you try to do stuff using the very basic building blocks. Um, I think a, a, a similar change that's that's also happening is increasing um, sort of use of SQL, um, and it makes a lot of sense both because it's it's one of the most powerful ways like as any kind of user to go and query the data, but also because there are uh, many external tools and many people inside an organization who either just know SQL or they just know tools built on top of it. So that's another thing that you know quickly came out is Spark SQL, and now a lot of the work in the project is, uh, is is on that. And I think that can also increase the number of like successful users uh, quite a bit, even beyond just the, the people using the data frame API. Um, and there are also kind of things that are not in Spark, but tie into the same thing. Like all the work on Delta Lake is because we saw that a huge number of the, both the reliability and performance issues that our customers had were about uh, cloud storage and uh, how how to make that robust, how to uh, how to make it efficient to find the data you need for a query, um, how to do updates safely without breaking the data set and corrupting it. And so, uh, for that, the solution was like a, this this transactional storage layer. So, yeah, we're just looking. We we do think that there can be a lot more people. I think in general, with whatever tool you use today, data. Um, analysis is just more complex than it needs to be. And it's going to look a lot simpler in five or 10 years. So we're trying to figure out what that should look like. Gotcha. Yeah. And so and that's actually related to Sid's question about, you know, how important it is to learn, you know, things like Scrum or Tableau or SQL Power BI. You, you've <laughs> definitely called out the importance of SQL, a la Spark SQL, a la the Data Frames APIs. Are there interrelated to Sid's question, Sid's question, like, do, are there other 
technologies that you see at the forefront, whether it, it not necessarily hmm. spark per se, but technologies that you feel, whether it's from the work that you do at Dawn or just any other things that you feel that are super important, exactly mm-hmm. to your point about data analysis, about data exploration, machine learning. And we'll actually, and that will also segue to our talk a little bit about machine learning as well, by the way. So. Yeah, I think in terms of just technologies to learn as a as a data scientist or engineer or analyst, like anyone working with data, I would say, um, like actually one of the most important is just also um, kind of basic um, statistics and and kind of what can go wrong when you try to use data for something. How do you make sure it's valid um, and so on? Like th- that's a that's an important thing. Otherwise, it doesn't really matter what you're doing on top of it if either the thing you're measuring is wrong or the base data is wrong. So and and there are also you know there's like some basic stuff you can do to sanity check things. There are also technologies around like data quality in there and data validation that are coming up, like expectations, for example. Uh, there's this Python library, great expectations, and there's this this concept in, in other systems too. So I think that's an interesting one is like, as you've got these volumes of data that maybe no one will look at, how do you make sure that they're solid and and keep, uh, keep working well? Um, in terms of like new emerging research things, I do think within machine learning, I think transfer learning specifically and maybe multitask learning in the longer term will be very important. So, cause that's for most use cases, if you don't have a huge data set or a lot of labels, that's like how uh, you, can, you can use existing models to, to do something. Um, and, uh, and there's, you know, there's quite a bit of subtlety there and different ways to do it. Got it. Got it. So, so based, you know, just to sort of do a quick rehash, because I'd like to dive down a little bit into each one of these things. One is that focus on scaling data engineering, right? Uh, and the one is that focus of the, the new emerging technologies. When, when it comes to scaling data engineering, you, I'm going to actually going to switch, jump off a little bit to ask the question. You are both a professor at Stanford and also the chief technologist at Databricks. Mm-hmm. So, I guess the qu- qu- first question is number one: How do you even balance all that? Like the, that seems like a lot of work. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, well, I, I have is definitely yeah two two different things, but I I mean I, I've set them up in in a way where hopefully I can do useful stuff in in both environments. So um, I think um, I mean the key thing is I I do have like days that I block off for various things so that you know they can keep going and I, I try to work on things where I can have an impact but without like lots of you know um, unpredictable uh, kind of issues coming up but it's it's quite I think it's it's helpful to be involved in both of them um, for actually both the use cases so like as a professor you know one of the main issues is how can you find new research problems to work on that are both like real problems and um, you know, scientifically interesting and could be impactful. And I think working with customers in a lot of domains to, to see how what problems they're trying to do with data and AI is very uh, useful for that. It definitely can inspire a lot of interesting work uh, and can also provide opportunities like to, you know, to, you know, just if a student wants to talk about something or whatever, you know, I, I know some people who do something like that. Um, and then uh, on the flip side, like just for myself, I learned a lot of things from the community there, from all the colleagues, you know, I can just go talk to someone about the latest thing in hardware or the latest thing in like some type of algorithm for learning or, or whatever. So um, that's also useful for me to, to see what's happening and what might be important uh, or not important for you know the company to uh, to know about uh, but yeah. they are different jobs i mean they're not, you know they're long-term research versus uh actually building something uh you know usable and robust they're, they're quite different gotcha and so back to the usable and robust aspect of things so when you d- d- discussing things about for example the delta lake storage or about uh, expectations things of that nature mm-hmm. uh, you is it do you find that it was you as a chief technologist are you typically going ahead and talking to customers to find out how this works or are you more working with the engineers i think it's the reason i'm asking the question is less about is more of letting the audience understand some of the process that you do in order to be able to understand better 
like what what these data engineering things because in some ways they're a little bit mundane right they're a little bit boring in a lot of ways yet that reliability of the data actually ultimately will ensure that you can actually do good analysis right so you you obviously know that so the context is how do you learn that process like as mm -hmm. you're working with customers yeah it's it's a mix of a few things so i think working with customers and there's also like the, the the actual users who use the platform and then there's also like the managers of the team or the executives they ask them you know what's what's top on your mind and they might say well you know we 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 launched this product but it's not very robust or whatever because we we have to you know the data is breaking or, or something um so that's one thing um but then i think also just uh trying to do something yourself like actually use the technology and try to do something gives you a different perspective. Um, and then there's, of course, working with the engineers or the people at Databricks who um, either work on that product or have interacted with many customers on it and have ideas on um, on that. Um, so, and it's also, there, I think there's like a few different types of work. One of them is just fixing kind of rough edges and something that's already out there versus the other one is like kind of inventing something new, maybe a, a new way of thinking about something new API uh, or a new abstraction like Delta Lake. So those are also, those have to be treated in, in different ways. I think for the, the new abstraction thing, you, um, it, it, you really want to validate it with multiple you know, potential users and you want to be very picky about what goes in to, so it doesn't get too complicated and so on. Um, yeah. Yeah, makes sense. And then actually going talking about the exact same process, one of the projects that's near and dear to your heart is also MLflow. Flow. And so why not tell the audience a little bit about how did you go down that journey? Like in terms of being able to, from the idea of, okay, I want to help the machine learning community to in fact, building an open source project called MLflow, Flow, right? So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, so that's one of those things where um, we, you know, we saw that um, uh, a lot of our use cases were in machine learning, and we tried to investigate, you know, what's challenging about those. And at the same time, we also saw there was this this trend in the industry of all the concept of machine learning platforms as an important piece of infrastructure for doing ML, and we saw there was no open source machine learning platform that's like widely usable. There were just things, each company kind of had its own thing. And then some of the big tech companies wrote, you know, blog posts and stuff about them, but you know, many other companies also had their own uh, thing for this and their own ML platform like team that's supposed to design it and maintain it and so on. So we thought, okay, the, the, the problems that came up were in the same spirit and there was also this opportunity uh, uh, to, to, to make one that's open source and then to benefit from community collaboration on it instead of like everyone including ourselves building everything from scratch so um, so that's kind of how that came about but yeah it, it was um, you know we, we started with some just some um, interviews with people and documentation like some you know proposed apis and so on that we thought were good and then when we thought those looked okay we built the prototype we had some uh kind of beta users and uh we went from there with with that and we tried to keep it small and just add stuff over time this is still doing less than actually kind of i wanted in the, in the initial document there's a lot of stuff that's like still missing that we had in the plan but we're we're adding those things as we you know, as we get feedback and as we think like it's ready to add some new component in there. Got it. Well, actually, let, let's dive right into that. Actually, that's a good that's a good segue to the next question, which is so, you know, we have in MLflow, we have tracking, we have projects. We now we have even uh, the model repository, which is which is awesome. What are some of the things that you would like to see per your original document, what you originally mm -hmm. have planned that you'd yeah. like to see next potentially? Sure. Yeah. One of the things that we're still working on having a great um, API for is uh, is actually multi-step workflows or, or pipelines. So how can you hook together a lot of steps, make them modular, make them easy to test in isolation? So uh, we have some prototypes of that, but we want to make sure that it's it's a really solid way of doing it. So for now, we we mostly recommend you know use MLflow with some other workflow technology such as uh, Apache Airflow or something like that. Uh, but we think if you do integrate it with the other stuff that MLflow knows about, uh, it could be it could be nice. It could be easier to use. 
Um, so that's like one of those. Um, there's also a bunch of stuff around, for example, uh, capturing more information about the environment where you ran um, an experiment and just having that automatically, maybe automatically reproducing the same environment when you serve. Um, there's some work that we we started doing on model schemas. So how do you declare like what data types the model expects, and then you can tell if you're putting in the wrong data or if you if you upgrade your model and actually you change the schema. Um, so that's a basic concept that I think will it, it's actually in the it's been merged now as a concept in the in the project but a lot of the UI components around it are not done yet but I think that will be a really uh, really interesting one uh, to work with um, so those are just some of the ones that were in there and then there are bigger things that could become components like monitoring the model in production that um, right now we don't have a you know recommended way to do that in the platform but maybe we could Got it. Got it. So <clears throat> re related to this, then do you, do you feel that like oh, some of the questions that, that are being asked in the Q and a panel are related to basically auto ML, right? For example, mm -hmm. right. And yeah, we, yeah. Right, we have some projects that are specific to Databricks, right? Uh, uh, like HyperOpt or whatever uh, and such, but then do you feel that in, you know, from your position, does it make sense that auto ML is an ML flow component, or do you feel that that's more of a, like a separate component, a database component or, or some other project component just from your perspective? Yeah, I think right now it's, there is still so much uh, activity in auto ML. I don't think there's like a very standard way of doing it where everyone says, yeah, this is the algorithm and the API to do auto ML. So I think for now, we've mostly been uh, trying to make it easy to use existing auto ML libraries and methods. And we have uh, we have both this, this integration with HyperOp to scale it out over Spark, which we open sourced. It's, it's part of HyperOp now. And we have this Databricks auto ML toolkit that's like a kind of an end-to-end -end toolkit um, using our platform and, and some of these tools together to do uh, to do auto ML. Um, and there's also a lot of you know activity in terms of new libraries coming out and so on. So right now we just try to make sure that's easy to use. And ML flow focuses on things that we're pretty sure you'll need in a in a platform long term, uh, like for example, recording information about your experiments and uh, you know tracking information about models and you know deploying the right version of a model or getting notified when it gets updated and so on. So that's kind of the distinction. These more researchy things, it's it's risky to bake them into like an API now and force someone to use it. Um, uh, so so we're not doing that. Um, yeah. Makes makes a ton of sense. Otherwise, the API keeps changing on you. <laughs> yeah, but auto ML itself is definitely yeah. gaining traction. We have a lot of uh, cases where people are using it. I think one of the most interesting ones is actually where people have they want to build many models, like maybe personalized models, or maybe for legal reasons they can't. Um, they actually can't aggregate data, let's say across mm -hmm. geographic regions or across their customers, uh, but they do want to deploy ML in those cases. So, so what they're doing is they, they're running auto ML to, to generate like, you know, maybe thousands or even millions of models, like say for each customer of a large organization or for each device in a, you know, in an industrial uh, manufacturer's pipeline or whatever. Um, and then uh, you need a good auto ML library to do that. And then they just monitor on top of those, like which models are doing really poorly or whatever. But that's a case where like, it makes a lot of sense to, to use it. Um, cool, cool. Well, so, okay. I'm actually gonna switch gears again, but only because a lot of the questions seem to be about the academics and education side of the house. So I'm mm -hmm. gonna, I'm gonna actually just uh, choose Alvin's question. He's, uh, he's, uh, he's asking you as a professor, uh, do you actively engage with your students in your classes, you know, um, whether uh, from the perspective of Databricks per se, since you're the CT, you know, chief technologist, or do you use some other mechanisms? Um, like how do you basically engage with them ultimately in, learning data science machine learning mm -hmm. yeah no well i definitely don't don't make them use databricks that's a <laughs> that's a conflict of interest so yes, i'm, it would I'm be, not yes. supposed to do that so um uh so um i think the yeah basically the so in terms of research like research is sort of longer term anyway and i'm most of my research is on things that like wouldn't necessarily be immediately related to databricks also most of it is not even related to Spark in any way. It's actually related to machine learning and hardware and stuff like that. Uh, but I think for if people want to, 
you know, maybe as part of their work, they want to talk with someone who's doing these things in production or whatever, then of course I'll, I'll connect them with people at Databricks who are doing that. Um, and in terms of education, there's a lot, the, the great news now is that a lot of stuff is, is open source and, um, uh, you know, there are many platforms that you can run them. So I, I do try to in, include some stuff about, you know, open source technologies, but again, most of the classes are, are more about the concepts. They're not a, like, we don't have a class where like, you just learn Spark, for example, uh, that would be something that, you know, you, you're doing a different thing. You might find an online class or something if you, if you want to do that. But our class is like, you know, principles of database systems. It's like, it's more like what's a transaction and what's a, you know, what are the trade-offs in storing data in different ways and so on. Gotcha. So yeah. basically the academics and the math behind it, that's what you're typically teaching. Yeah. And the, yeah. or the design, like what are yeah. the trade-offs, the different ways of designing. Yeah. Yeah. But then uh, I guess, but interrelated and also uh, a question from Glenn here. Uh, and this actually reminds me of the time where we, when Databricks started, one of the focuses was to go ahead and actually teach people the, uh, uh, yep. not the academic side of the house, but the application side of the house. Like for example, the, the massive, S, ma excuse me, massive effort on training Spark, for example, or uh, getting people to understand data science and machine learning. Um, how do you feel like, whether it's yourself or the company or any company for that matter, when it comes to like teaching these type of technologies, the, the importance or the effort that requires uh, to, to get people to, to actually help educate people how these technologies work? Yeah, I think this is super important for Databricks and also for for just the Spark project early on. We actually ran these training workshops at Berkeley that um, you know people could attend to learn the software. Um, and um, so, yeah, I think the um, I think it's important to have really good training material and to keep updating it over time and to have relevant examples. Um, and it's hard because as things change, you have to go and you know, update everything that was out there. Otherwise people are learning outdated stuff. So um, I don't know what the best way to do this is. We've done some, quite a bit of stuff that's free like massive online courses and so on. Um, and then usually for the in-person things uh, where like you have to have an instructor there, uh, they focus a lot on making sure you actually interact with the instructor and can ask questions and stuff. That's the thing you wouldn't get if you just watch some videos online. Um, so that's kind of what we've chosen, but uh, often those instructors in the course of designing the hands-on like paid class, they'll also create materials that we maybe can use in for a self-paced thing. Um, yeah. Gotcha. Gotcha. So that, that leads to a slightly different question, which is related to uh, an earlier question from one of the audience, which is um, a lot of the work that you're doing has a lot to do with distribution, like distributed machine learning, distributed uh, Spark for that matter. It's all about distribution. But then how about those single thread approaches? Like, you know, mm -hmm. how when you start off with pandas or NumPy, right? Uh, how do you feel the approaches of trying to make those systems more scalable, right? We can mm -hmm. talk, whether it's like, you know, UDF, pandas, UDFs or Qualys, I mean, just your perspectives on these things, basically. Yeah, so this is one of the first things I started working on in this Weld research project as when I uh, started as a professor. Um, and um, so there's a lot of room to improve the performance of these single node libraries that people use. Interestingly, a lot of it is when you, uh, in a more complicated piece of code as you combine lots of functions. Like for example, each function in NumPy or in Pandas is pretty efficient on its own, but then, um, a program that calls like 10 or 20 of them is maybe not uh, efficient because it's just moving stuff in and out of memory, reshaping it, uh, or just streaming it through the processor many times between those those functions. So um, so we started this project well that's kind of imagining a, a kind of like a VM or runtime for them where they submit code and then it does optimization across them. Um, it leads to like really great speed ups, but it's also, uh, you know, it's it, it takes a while, like it's a, it's a, somewhat challenging thing for a library to adopt. So it requires migration. So that's hard. We have some prototypes and so on. You can actually download it from PyPy and use a weld accelerated pandas and NumPy. And they're going more and more mature, but I think it will take a while for, for that to be super widely usable unless some of the library developers like step in and um, kind of adopt this approach to, to speed up the libraries. 
and because of the cost of adopting that in in existing software and the fact that like now you know all these library developers kind of have to learn something about compilers which is you know which is hard um we also tried uh, some different approaches so actually i'm really excited about this this system called mozart it's it's part of this approach we call split annotations where um, you just put annotations on the functions like you say you know this function in numpy is commutative or like this function you can split up the input this way um, and it's it's a little bit like if people use typescript you had a an existing library and you just put these annotations about the types and suddenly you got some new capabilities so this uses those annotations to optimize the computation and it requires no changes to the library and it actually matches things like weld and uh, TensorFlow XLA and, and Numba and so on in a lot of cases while being you know, much less invasive uh, to the library. So I'm excited about that approach. We're still actively working on it. And I really hope to get to something that is kind of a drop-in replacement for these libraries or actually gets merged into them. But it is a bunch of engineering work to do. Um, we're actually th also trying to see if we can do that automatically, which, which will be more interesting. But again, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's risky. It's kind of hard to do it. If it works, that will be really, really interesting. Uh, so take an existing library and automatically discover how to, how to parallelize all the functions and stuff in it. Well, that would actually be a really cool project, I have to admit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's saying the nice this, thing. <laughs> yeah. Saying this, no, I, I just actually, I did want to wrap it up because we were pretty much done with the questions that we have here. Um, and we actually were taking a little over time as it was anyways, because I realized everybody is trying, probably trying to get prepped for the next meeting. So I just want to finish off with just any last or not last, but, you know, quick thoughts that, uh, concerning like the, uh, about, well, for example, uh, some of the things that you plan to talk about at uh, the upcoming Spark Summit, which of course, mm -hmm. uh, we'd love all of you to go ahead and join us. <laughs> Yeah, there's actually a lot of exciting stuff coming out at this Spark AI Summit uh, on a variety of fronts, like a, a lot of open source, you know, project related things. So I encourage you to check it out, not just Spark stuff, but MLflow and uh, Delta Lake and, and maybe some new things that we're working on as well. Um, so, uh, yeah, and I guess one one thing I'll talk about there is that, uh, so the first um open source release of Spark was in 2010, which is about, you know, which is 10 years ago now. So now it's like kind of 10 years after that. Of course, like the first, you know, let's say four years or whatever were mostly at a university, but I do want to talk about both like, like what's changing and, you know, various things that we learned in the process um, uh, of doing that. Um, yeah, so I think, again, my, my high level thought uh, here is just that, um, you know, obviously this large scale data and ML infrastructure, um, it, it's had a lot of positive impact. It's, you can do a lot of things with it, but it's still very complicated to use compared to like, I think how it could be. So um, I think there's room to make things simpler uh, for whatever, for Spark users and hopefully for other users as well. So, and I'd love to hear like, you know, other, ways that people want to do that in the future yeah perfect well hey matei i really appreciate your time thanks very much for this awesome data and ai online meetup interview today uh karen why don't we uh, close it with you to wrap things up please yeah thanks thanks everyone for the questions too yeah thanks